The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, the witch hunt that has nothing to do with Halloween. Fox News' Greg Jarrett exposes the left's crusade to get Trump and the greatest political scandal of all time. Plus, nightmare in paradise. He was um, throwing up bile. A vacationer is rushed to the OR. That was the moment that my heart sank. And the odds were stacked against him. Statistically, I shouldn't be alive. How he survived on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Blood in the water. That's what Democrats smell regarding Republicans and health care. And they plan to use it next month to reclaim state legislative seats Democrats lost when President Obama was in the White House. What can Republicans do to stop the bleeding? Jennifer Wishon explains. We hear an awful lot about the 2020 presidential race, but next month, 538 state legislative seats are up for grabs. And the winners of those races, plus more to come next year, will shape the makeup of Congress for a decade. Voters in Louisiana, Mississippi, New Jersey, and Virginia cast their votes November 5th. While President Obama was in the White House, Democrats lost nearly 1,000 state legislative seats. Now they're laser focused on getting them back and they're punching the Republicans on health care. Sturdivant voted to deny access to health coverage to 400,000 Virginians and expand plans that let insurance companies deny coverage for pre-existing conditions. Kick people with pre-existing conditions off their health insurance. Democrats know protections for people with pre-existing conditions are popular. And even though President Trump says he supports those protections, there's been no action, and Democrats smell blood. Republicans just don't do health care. This has never been one of their strong suits, and it's a real and decades-long problem. It's one of the reasons we got the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is because Republicans have paid insufficient attention to this issue. Tuesday, a group of House Republicans working closely with the White House released a proposal they say gives Americans freedom of choice, a clear alternative to socialist policies popular on the left. Parts of that proposal are really strong. They would take the 828 billion dollars of workers earnings that employers now get to control because of a weird quirk of the tax code they would give that 828 billion dollars to the workers who earned it that's a huge change and then the workers could buy their own health insurance that stays with them as they move from job to job rather than having their employer choose a plan for them that disappears when they move to another job and at the president's urging protections for pre-existing conditions we want to protect pre-existing conditions by treating those who are self-employed the same way we treat those who get insurance through their job. And how the health care debate turns out could have a lot to do with those state legislative races, because after the 2020 census, those lawmakers will draw congressional lines that will stand through 2030. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. You know, I watched uh, in that last congressional race how the Democrats just beat the Republicans all over the place, and the Republicans are worrying about some wall down in the southern border, and the Democrats were saying, we're going to take care of your health care, and they're not going to give you health coverage for pre-existing conditions. They're using the same playbook, and it is absolutely crucial that the Republicans who now hold the uh, control of the Senate pass some kind of a resolution to say, look, we favor uh, insurance for pre-existing conditions. They need to do it, and the, uh, you, you, we see here in Virginia day after day after day hammering away on the same playbook that the Democrats used uh, in the last election, exactly the same thing. So uh, to lose all the control, because the redistricting of these seats will be controlled by the state legislatures. And the districts will determine who are the next congressmen are going to be. And it's a very, very important thing. And the, the, both parties are spending millions and millions of dollars to try to get that thing uh, uh, to win that particular race. But I don't think the, the Republicans yet have picked it up. But at least right now they're starting to do something. 
But I think Mitch McConnell in the Senate needs to pass a resolution right now saying we favor uh, some type of insurance for pre-existing conditions and then let everybody buy into that uh, uh, assertion, because if they don't do it, they're going to be hurt really badly for the next 10 years. Well, in other news, Republicans are firing back at House Democrats, calling their impeachment inquiry, quote, illegitimate. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. And Pat, President Trump firing back as well, describing the probe as a lynching. Democrats say that's offensive, but some GOP lawmakers are defending the president's comparison. As Mark Martin reports, they say the closed door sessions deprive the president the opportunity to defend himself. Senator Lindsey Graham plans to introduce a resolution condemning the closed door impeachment inquiry, which he calls illegitimate. We cannot allow future presidents and this president to be impeached based on an inquiry in the House that's never been voted upon that does not allow the president to confront the witnesses against him, call witnesses on his behalf, and cross-examine people who are accusing him of misdeeds. One of those witnesses, acting U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Bill Taylor, testified Tuesday that he was told that if the president of Ukraine did not announce he was launching the investigations, President Trump would not release aid to Ukraine or agree to a White House meeting. The testimony also said Trump repeatedly told officials he wasn't after a quid pro quo, but established a trade between the U.S. aid and the investigations. A White House statement calls Taylor's testimony a triple hearsay and said the career diplomat is a radical, unelected bureaucrat. Vice President Mike Pence insisted there was no quid pro quo. The American people can read the transcript of the phone call the president had with President Zelensky, and they will see there was no quid pro quo. But Democratic Congressman Andy Levin of Michigan found Taylor's testimony troubling. In my Ten short months in Congress, it's not even noon, right? And this is the my most disturbing day in Congress so far. Meanwhile, the president is under fire for describing the impeachment inquiry as a lynching. But how dare he compare our constitutional obligation for oversight to a hate crime? But on the CBN News program, Faith Nation, a member of the Trump Leadership Council, Dr. Bill Bennett, said it was not a problem to use that word. The president is visceral in his reactions. I don't know if you've noticed that, but he tends to say the first thing that comes into his head. Yeah, I think it's okay. As I think you pointed out uh, high-tech lynching is what Clarence Thomas said. The Clinton protesters talked about lynching. Lynching has become a term more, much more broadly in use. On the issue of those closed-door hearings, Democrats say they plan to hold public hearings in coming weeks. Mark Martin, CBN News. Pat, no doubt things are heating up here in the Beltway. Well, they should heat up because th this thing is illegitimate, what's being done in the House. And uh, what Lindsey Graham said is absolutely right. Uh, you cannot have one party leading an impeachment in, in one House of Congress without a vote, and they don't want to take a vote. If they want this impeachment so badly, why don't they just take a vote? Well, because they're, they're people that were representative in swing districts that don't want to be seen as anti-Trump and pro-impeachment. So Nancy Pelosi is protecting them. That's the yeah. whole game. It's a game. Well, if the election were today, Pat, yeah. who do you think the Democratic ticket what would the Democratic ticket look like? Well, it, it looks like uh, uh, Joe Biden is moving ahead, but you've got Elizabeth Warren, you've got Bernie Sanders. It doesn't seem like either one of them will be able to form a coalition. I can't imagine who would be the vice president with Bernie Sanders or who would be the vice president with Elizabeth Warren. What about Mayor Pete? He did pretty well, well in the last election. Pete did so well. And, you know, the amazing ticket might wind up being Bernie Sanders as as presidential candidate and Buttigieg as, as vice presidential candidate, and you got the BB ticket. Bernie, not Biden. But you know, you're not, not Bernie Biden. I'm, excuse me, I'm, I meant Biden. Oh, Bi Biden, Biden, not Biden and, and Buttigieg. And Buttigieg. It, that, that could be, well, who knows, but it, it's so chaotic right now, but you know it's going to be Trump-Pence. I don't think that the Republicans, they've got their ticket pretty much lined up, but the Democrats is still in such flux. But it looks like Buttigieg came through so strongly in that debate, and uh, he's obviously not going to go for first place, but uh, he is uh, uh, an open uh, homosexual with a, uh, uh, 
a, a male wife, mm -hmm. so uh, he could uh, guarantee the LGB, whatever that thing is, that that, that LGBTQ segment. LGBTQ vote, <laughs> LGBTQ vote. All that segment of the population would be brought in. But anyway. But Warren uh, has been doing so well. You, you don't you don't see a Biden Warren ticket at all. I, I can't believe that Biden would take Warren or Warren yeah. would take Biden. I, I just, but we'll see. I mean, hey, it's it's in flux, and we've never seen so many candidates at one time. But uh, anyhow, I would just say uh, keep your eyes on B and B. <laughs> B and B. All right. B &B. All right, John. What's next? Pat, turning overseas, Russian and Turkish troops are moving into parts of northern Syria after Turkish President Erdogan and Russian President Putin struck a deal to end Turkey's invasion and divide the spoils. As Chris Mitchell reports, President Trump's decision to pull out American forces is likely to have consequences far beyond the Middle East. The Turkish invasion has not restarted, but CBN's Chuck Colton reports there's still fighting going on near the front lines. There are still sporadic uh, bouts of fighting in this area between the FSA forces and the Syrian Democratic forces. There are also uh, mortar uh, attacks and uh, bombs from drones being dropped. This after Russia and Turkey agreed to remove Kurdish fighters and patrol the security zone. Presidents Erdogan and Putin set down new guidelines for northeast Syria. The long-term stabilization of Syria, in general, can only be achieved, in our opinion, by observing Syria's sovereignty and territorial integrity. As of noon, October 23rd, within 150 hours, YPG terrorists and their weapons will be removed from 30 kilometers of the Turkish border and the organization's fortifications and positions will be destroyed. The deal also allows Turkey to control land it invaded, calls for joint Turkish-Russian patrols and for the Syrian regime to fill the vacuum of Kurdish-held areas. The deal between Presidents Erdogan and Putin marked the end of an era in northeast Syria and a stunning shift in power to Russia. It's crucial to note this is Russia, more than any other single country right now, that holds the whip hand in Syria. You know, Putin is effectively kind of the sheriff uh, of Syria right now and everybody is answerable to him. And that's a result of the, uh, the, the rapid U.S. withdrawals taking place over the last week. Syrian Kurds and others in northeast Syria felt betrayed by the U.S. decision and threw rock shoes and potatoes at U.S. forces as they left the area. Some are on their way to Iraq, but Iraq's defense minister said those troops will have to leave in four weeks. President Trump compared the situation to a schoolyard fight. It's like two kids in a playground. They fight. You let them fight for a minute, and then you pull them apart. But the fight has left hundreds dead, hundreds of thousands displaced from their homes, and an historic geopolitical shift in the region. On Capitol Hill, both Democrats and Republicans tried to reassert U.S. presence in Syria. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell introduced a resolution opposing the U.S. pullout from Syria and warned the U.S. pullout benefits Russia, Assad, Iran, and ISIS. A broader approach uh, to America's position in the world, which I think and 70 senators thought earlier this year, is uh, more forward-leaning, certainly, than the decision the administration had made with regard uh, to getting our troops out of eastern Syria. The pullout has resulted in a loss of U.S. credibility in the region. We're just not sure how much we can rely on the United States now or in the future. That is the reality on, on the ground. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Pat, this deal represents a huge shift in the balance of power in the Middle East. It has. It was a geopolitical blunder of massive proportions, and uh, our children and grandchildren will have to leave with it because the reputation of the United States as a reliable ally does not exist anymore. And who's going to join with us and, and give their sons and daughters uh, to sacrifice, uh, as the Kurds have done, if this is the way they're going to be treated and be called like a schoolhouse, bullies fighting in a, and then being pulled apart. Hundreds of thousands of people are, are losing their lives and are losing their homes and losing their property. It's very serious. Well, shifting to the United States, I talked to my daughter who lives in Dallas, Texas, and she told me the consequences of recent hurricanes and tornadoes have been simply devastating. and. Uh, 
uh, I just want to show you some of the pictures of those people who are such wonderful friends uh, who have suffered so much down in Texas. The weather has been ungodly. John. That's right, Pat. Dallas residents are cleaning up after a series of tornadoes devastated the area. Nine twisters swept through Dallas Sunday, including a powerful E3 with 140 mile an hour winds that tore a 15 mile path of destruction. About 300 buildings were destroyed or suffered major damage. Thankfully, Pat, no casualties from the storms. Power has been restored to some 130,000 customers. But Pat, some people are still in the dark. Well, I would just say please pray for our friends in Texas. Because not only did they have those uh, tornadoes, they also had what was called a bomb cyclone yeah. that hit with uh, torrential rains and uh, hurricane force winds. And it, it hit also, my, my daughter said that this tornado went up the Grand, uh, the Central Expressway right up and hit some of the uh, larger, larger, uh, more uh, affluent region mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and two schools are completely down, can't open and and it's, it's just and, and the the Home Depot there, fortunately, the manager gave told everybody to, to vacate the premises. And that Home Depot, from what I was told by my daughter, is totally Home, uh, Home Depot, Home Depot, totally devastated, oh my just completely. And those are always so busy and oh, crowded. Oh yeah, but I mean it's gone because of this terrible, terrible tornado. Tornadoes right. are so scary. At least with hurricanes, you have time to, to get out. That's you right. see, you can, you know, it's coming. But tornadoes. <laughs> And yeah. it's there. Okay. God bless him. Well, still ahead, bizarre behavior, acute pain in the back of the head, and suddenly a vacation turns deadly. What put this man down? That's coming up. But first, what's the dirtiest trick in political history and the greatest mass delusion? You're about to find out when Fox News' Greg Jarrett joins us live after this. I have in my hand one of the most amazing books. It's so thorough, so well-researched. It's called Witch Hunt, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history, written by Greg Jarrett. And it's an interesting book that you ought to get your hands on. Russian collusion, quid pro quo. Democrats will try anything to undo the 2016 election. But who's really behind these assaults on the president? And why is one author calling this, quote, the dirtiest trick in American political history? Take a look. In his first book, the number one New York Times bestseller, The Russia Hoax, Fox News legal and political analyst Greg Jarrett detailed the scheme by the FBI and Department of Justice to bring down Donald Trump during the 2016 election. All of Jarrett's claims in that book were borne out by the Mueller report released earlier this year. Now Jarrett is back with an explosive follow-up, Witch Hunt, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history. In it, Jarrett contends that a small group of powerful government officials colluded with others and broke numerous laws to convince tens of millions that the president is a traitor without a shred of evidence. Well, Greg joins, uh, joins us from New York, and Greg, welcome back. Fabulous book. Yeah, thanks. Uh, tell us what you had about Rod Rosenstein. He appointed Mueller and started this whole thing. What, what, what was the behind the scenes? We've got Peter Strzok, we've got Lisa Page, we've got all those people. Who, who are the main actors? Well, the main actors are uh, James Comey, Andrew McKay, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, Bruce Orr at the uh, Department of Justice, but most of all, the malevolent Rod Rosenstein. It turns out that when Rosenstein appointed the special counsel, Bob Mueller, he knew there was no evidence of collusion. And so he made the appointment and, and this 22-month-long national nightmare, not because the law or evidence merited it, but because he grew angry. It was an act of vengeance against President Trump. Uh, Rosenstein, who had authored the memo recommending Comey's firing, became the butt of criticism. He became overwrought, emotional, and angry at Trump. So in a fit of pique uh, he, and spite, he decided to investigate the president, even though he knew there was no collusion. Uh, at the same time, 
He then plots with Andrew McKay behind closed doors to wear a secret wire and recruit cabinet members to invoke the 25th Amendment. And when it's all discovered, he rushes to the White House begging for his job. He boards Air Force One and the president asks him, is this true? Did you do this? And Rosenstein lied to the face of the president. I interviewed the president for more than an hour in the Oval Office. He told me the whole story. It's in my book. Greg, you also point out that Bob Mueller was a little bit uh, doughty, that he wasn't really in control of his faculties. Would you elaborate on that one? Yeah, it's really amazing. A year before the Mueller report came out in a meeting with Trump's lawyers, uh, Bob Mueller confessed there was no evidence of collusion, but he refused to tell the American people. He refused to file an interim report. And I interviewed all of the lawyers on Trump's defense team, and they all agreed they were deeply concerned about the mental state of Bob Mueller. He was lost confused, disoriented in their meetings. He didn't seem to understand uh, basic questions or fundamentals of the law like obstruction. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a year and a half later, when Mueller testifies, it was like the Wizard of Oz and the curtain was pulled back and the vaunted reputation of Bob Mueller wasn't what we thought it was. Well, you know, back to the, have anybody been prosecuted? You've got these actors who were trying to destroy the president of the United States and doing so under the guise of the uh, uh, FBI. Uh, have, have any of them gone to jail for doing that? Not yet. Uh, but as I write uh, towards the end of the book, you know, the only cure for a lie is the truth and the only remedy for lawlessness is justice. A reckoning awaits, and it's happening as we speak. We expect any day now the inspector general's report to come out. I, I think it will be a damning indictment of some of these actors I've named in the book. But more important than that, the attorney general, William Barr, appointed a very fine U.S. attorney, John Durham, to launch an investigation of how this could happen how the president of the United States could be victimized like this and essentially held hostage for two and a half years based on no evidence. We recently found out Durham has now expanded the probe, which as a lawyer tells me he's already found considerable evidence of corruption and potential crimes. Well, now that Mueller report actually, you know, a person is presumed innocent until he's proven guilty, but they were saying we can't find any evidence, but we don't know that he's innocent. I mean, you don't have to make a finding like that in anything. You're right. Bob Mueller and his team of partisans created a legal standard that doesn't exist and never has existed. This so-called we cannot exonerate. It's not the job of a prosecutor to exonerate someone. So they were very clever in order to get around Supreme Court decisions. And I, I explain all of this in chapter five of my book. What they did was they inverted the presumption of innocence and re reversed uh, the burden of proof. This is one of the most outrageous and unconscionable acts I've ever seen from uh, a set of prosecutors and you know they were they did it to smear trump they knew he did not obstruct justice and yet they were hoping that their volume to to smear would be used as a basis by congress to impeach the president well you know all this goes back to that thing that that uh, christopher steele and that uh, fusion gps and that was paid for by the Democrats. Are these all linked together, these various uh, occasions? Absolutely. It turns out, of course, that Trump never colluded with Russia, but the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee did. They paid for Russian disinformation through an ex-British spy, Christopher Steele, that was used as the basis of the witch hunt. Uh, it, it's so amazing to me that the media, which were witting accessories to all of this, paid no attention to what Hillary Clinton did, but devoted all of their scrutiny to what Donald Trump did not do. Uh, chapter two of the book is entitled Clinton Collusion, and it lays out the evidence 
and the documentation of how she was the financier of the witch hunt. The CIA director, John Brennan, uh, was the instigator and the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, was the prodigious leaker. And we've just learned in the last 24 hours now that John Durham, who is leading Bill Barr's investigation, intends to uh, interview both Clapper and Brennan. They have a lot to answer for. Uh, last week, there's some anonymous person who's going to uh, write an op-ed critical of the president and the official is then writing a book. What, what does that tell you about the deep state? The deep state is alive and well. I refer to them in my book as the malignant force. That's how I, I open the book. And, you know, this anonymous individual um, lacks courage. It's an act of cowardice to, to try to smear the president uh, anonymously. Uh, but, you know, the deep force is and the malignant force, you know, they are alive and well today and they are still trying to remove the president, undo the 2016 election results. And, you know, this latest witch hunt, I call this now the Ukraine witch hunt, mm -hmm. uh, is utterly ludicrous. Uh, it's based on absolutely nothing. The Department of Justice Criminal Division looked at the conversation between Presidents Trump and Zelensky and concluded there's no crime here. So now through these secret hearings by Adam Schiff, uh, Democrats are embracing this amorphous concept called abuse of power, which is nowhere in the Constitution and has no fixed meaning. Maybe they'll vote for impeachment. It will go nowhere in the U.S. Senate because those senators are wise to this act. Well, Greg, I, I want to congratulate you on this book. This thing is voluminous. It is, it is absolutely one of the most extraordinary books that's been written on this whole subject, Witch, witch Hunt. And I hope many people get a chance to read it. Greg, thanks so much for being with us. Many thanks for having me, Pat. Thank you. Okay. Wendy? All right. Great interview. Well, coming up, a nap becomes a living nightmare, and a CAT scan reveals a massive bleeding on the brain. What chance of survival did this man have? And if he survived, would he ever be normal again? Then later, they're a dynamic husband and wife team who prayed for thousands worldwide. So what happened to them when leukemia hit home? Pat and Karen Schatzline share their heart-stopping story, coming up. Just imagine you're on a relaxing tropical vacation. You doze off for a nap and bam, you're startled awake by a searing pain shooting from your head down to your lower spine. That's what happened to Casey Stackhouse. And by the time he made it to the ER, he was not even conscious. Great. Casey and his wife, Kim, had just arrived in Key West to celebrate a new job offer. But just hours into their vacation, Casey wasn't feeling well and complained about neck pain. I looked at my wife and said, I've got to take a nap for at least an hour before we go to dinner. When I woke up from the nap, it was just like this radiating pain that shot from my head all the way down to my lower spine. It felt like somebody shot me in the back of the head. His behavior was becoming erratic and very bizarre. It just intensified throughout the night. He was um, throwing up bile, and at that point, I leaned over him in the bathroom and I said, that's it, I'm calling this. I'm taking you into the doctor. By the time they arrived at the hospital, Casey was slipping in and out of consciousness. Doctors told Kim there was massive bleeding on her husband's brain. That was the moment that my heart sank. I knew this was a life or death uh, situation that we were in. As Casey was life lighted to Miami, Kim cried out to God, and alerted their loved ones, who spread word to others to pray on Casey's behalf. And I just said, you know, Lord, I need you. Um, please just send your mightiest of angels to help us, and um, please heal Casey. Doctors diagnosed Casey with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, bleeding in the space surrounding the brain. In critical condition, he was rushed into surgery. Doctors told Kim there was a 40% chance Casey would survive. 
And if he did, he would more than likely live with limitations from brain damage, such as paralysis or memory loss. Concerned family and friends continued praying and believing for a miracle. I felt an enormous amount of peace and comfort. I knew we were being prayed for. After the second operation, Casey awakened. When I saw my wife, as I came to, I said, hey, babe. As soon as he started talking, it was just the utter relief knowing that he was speaking and he was aware. He was a little sarcastic too with one of the nurses, which made us laugh. So we were <laughs> thinking he's back, but it was just a joyous moment. Over the next several days, Casey underwent multiple extensive operations. A catheter was implanted into his brain to drain pressure. As he was monitored closely in ICU, Casey says God gave him confidence. I was feeling the tubes and the patches in, in my head, like, okay, this really did happen, like, but why? Why did this happen to me, and am I gonna be able to be the father, the husband, and am I gonna be able to work? And all those things, all those emotions were just coming, consuming me all at once, but it was through prayer that God gave me a sense of peace, letting me know that everything's going to be okay. It became evident to Casey's family and friends too. Each day in ICU, his condition steadily improved. By three weeks, his medical record showed no sign of bleeding on his brain. Casey was released and walked out of the hospital miraculously with no brain damage. He says prayer was his lifeline. Statistically, I shouldn't be alive. And it's through the power of prayer of people praying constantly for not just me, but my family. It has been overwhelming. <laughs> I absolutely know that my healing is a miracle. It was divine intervention um, that I'm here today. The doctors were completely shocked. He doesn't have any limitations and there's no paralysis. There's no cognitive issues. It has just been a truly amazing thing. Casey began seeing Dr. Sha'ad Bidewala two months after the incident for follow-up care. Casey's family picked up on his condition very quickly. Uh, he was airlifted to the hospital in Miami where he got excellent care. Uh, and, uh, you know, the doctors did all the right things there. You know, those are all important factors in his, his recovery, you know, but of course there's the most important factor of them all, and that is that, you know, he had somebody looking after him that day. It's God. He's, he, he provided, protected, and healed. Casey and Kim are thankful to family, friends, and even strangers for the many prayers said on his behalf. And he says the power of prayer is personal these days. The love, it's, it's love. And when love steps in, it all gets better. And it's only through God that that was able to re be revealed in me. He saved me. And life is truly precious. When love steps in, it all gets better. Couldn't say it better than that. Wow, what a story. This is a great movie. Here's one, Linda, who lived in Virginia Beach, felt lingering pain in her left side. Her doctor discovered something wrong with a valve in her heart. She was watching. Wendy said her name, declared she was healed. Linda said, that's me. I start feeling better. She had a cardiologist appointment. The doctor said her heart sounded perfect, blood pressure perfect, no longer leads heart medication. Praise the Lord. You don't know Linda. I don't know Linda. But the but Lord knew her. The Lord knew. All right, here's one. Travis of Albuquerque, New Mexico, served in the military during Desert Storm where he suffered a debilitating knee injury. One day he was watching the 700 Club when he heard you give a word of knowledge, Pat, saying there's someone with a knee injury and they have problems with swelling. The Lord wants to heal it. You will feel a sensation and you will be healed. Later that same night, Travis felt the sensation and immediately his knee felt better. The next day, the swelling went down. Two days later, the doctor confirmed Travis was healed. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say right now, with God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with the God we serve. Hitherto you've asked nothing in my name, Jesus said. Ask and you shall receive. Why? That your joy might be full. God wants you to have joy. And we're going to join hands together. We're going to pray for you, whatever the need is. 
whatever the need is, the God of heaven can, can and will answer. Amen. Father, I join hands with my sister in Christ, and we pray together for the people. There's somebody, uh, Mark, maybe, who's got a lump in your groin, and uh, it may be some kind of a protruding intestine. I'm not sure what it is, but there's a lump there. Just put your hand on it. In the name of Jesus, it's healed. Uh, Wendy. For someone, you have a terrible foot fungus, and you've had it for a while, and the doctors are confounded, but God is healing you, and you will be norm your foot will be normal soon, in Jesus' name. Uh, the psoriasis you've got on your arms, I believe the name is Mary, you, you, you're healed right now. Just touch, touch that and wipe it off in the name of Jesus. Wendy. Someone, you've had surgery on your on your arm, and there's an infection now, and God is touching you right now. Your arm will be saved, and and that is going away now in Jesus' name. Uh, financial burden is being lifted. Financial burden. Just just praise the Lord, and there's a lifting. You feel that the burden is just being. You know, he he once said to me, he said, "This is my work. I'll carry the burden." Mm -hmm. Well, he's carrying your burden right now. Give it to him. Don't keep that burden anymore. He's going to take care of your finances and start praising him for it in Jesus' name. Now, Father, just for everyone in this audience who's suffering, who's need has a need, answer their prayer, Lord. Touch them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Wendy. Well, coming up later, our number one favorite on YouTube, the always unpredictable, Your Questions, Honest Answers. David says, I've read in the Bible that knowledge will increase in the last days. Will humans go to planets like Mars before, before or during the tribulation? Stay tuned for Pat's answer on that. Plus, she was diagnosed with leukemia. But guess what? That wasn't her biggest threat. Karen Schatzlein and her husband, Pat, join us just ahead. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN Newsbreak. In London, the British Parliament has blocked Prime Minister Boris Johnson's fast-track Brexit deal from moving forward. Lawmakers support the substance of the deal, but not the Prime Minister's timetable. Johnson proposed only three days of debate, which he negotiated with the European Union. But members of Parliament say they need more time. Johnson may now push for an early general election to break the impasse. Britain is set to leave the European Union October 31st. Well, no sooner than Chick-fil-A established its first outlet on UK soil, an announcement that it is closing. The Christian fast food chain was targeted by pro-LGBT uh, LGBT groups with complaints and boycotts. Barely a week after opening in the Reading City Center Mall, the mall owners announced it will not be renewing Chick-fil-A's lease. In a statement, the company said, we have decided on this occasion that the right thing to do is to only allow Chick-fil-A to trade with us for the initial six-month pilot period and not to extend the lease any further. We seek to offer an inclusive space where everyone is welcome. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, some people call it the big C. Pat and Karen Schatzline refused to say that word at all after Karen was diagnosed with leukemia. The couple had spent their lives praying for people all over the world. And suddenly, they were the ones in desperate need of prayer. Pat and Karen Schatzline are international evangelists who founded Remnant Ministries in 1997. The couple has prayed for the healing of others for years and recently faced their own health crisis. In 2017, the Schatz lines were shocked when Karen was diagnosed with leukemia. They say that fear was a constant temptation and launched them into an intense spiritual battle. In their latest book, Restore the Roar, the Schatz lines explain how they've learned to overcome fear and find peace even in the darkest times. 
please welcome to the 700 Club for the very first time, Karen and Pat Schatzlein. And oh. you said this was a dream for you guys to be on this show. Yes, you, you know, it, it really was. You know, we've, we've written all these books and, and uh, traveled the world, but Pat Robertson and the whole 700 Club has always been. Yes. Uh, I, I mentioned it a moment ago, I actually was a part of his campaign in 1988. And so wow. that's pretty cool. Oh, he's going to be thrilled to hear that. Well, Karen, let's start with you. What was your diagnosis and how did you respond to it at first? Well, when I first got diagnosed, it was after several months of not knowing what was wrong, going from doctor to doctor. Sure. But when I, uh, it actually started about six months before the diagnosis when I was standing at my kitchen sink just doing dishes. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're about to walk through a difficult and uncertain season, but do you trust me? Mm. And that began the journey. I had no idea until several months later, I started developing symptoms that I couldn't explain and actually ended up being being sent to an oncologist and found myself sitting on in the chair looking in the eyes of an oncologist who was telling me that there was leukemia mm. in my blood. And in that moment, I was taken back to that moment at the kitchen sink. Right. And all I heard at that moment was, do you trust me? You, and wow. that was a defining moment for me and for Pat because, you know, God had prepared us without us even realizing it, that that was coming, but we could trust him no matter what. Pat, how did you, how did you respond? You know, uh, I, I've just learned that we, we've always said this, you got to live somewhere between amen and there it is. Yeah. And, <laughs> and in all honesty, the reason why we, we wrote the book, Restore the Roar is because at the other side of it, you know, I, I always say it's easiest to backslide on the other side because you get lethargic you just get weary. And the Lord spoke to me one day in a hotel room and said, you know, where did your roar go? And I was, I was weeping and we were ministering somewhere, getting ready to go to Europe. But during that process, we just made up our mind. You know, we have an altar in our bedroom. And every time we'd come home from the doctor, we would lay that doctor's report on the altar and mm -hmm. say, we refuse yeah. this. Yeah. Wow. And get out of bed praying, turning wow. worship on. Yeah and saying, but God, you've got this. And still ministering, still getting on planes every week, the whole thing. And both of you, you refuse to say the word cancer. You refuse to say the word leukemia. I'm sorry for saying it right now. Yeah. Uh, and you wouldn't let your doctor say it either. Yeah. I mean, how, why? Well, I, from the very beginning, when God said, do you trust me? I decided that if he was asking me to trust him, then there was a different yeah. answer wow. than what the doctor was telling me. So I actually looked at the doctor and he probably thought I was crazy because I said, I understand what you're saying. I'm not in denial. Right. I completely understand, but I don't want you to call it that because like if my kids bring home a stray dog, I'm not going to name it because <laughs> if you name it, you keep it. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> and I said, I don't intend to keep this. I know this is what we see in the natural, but I'm not going to call it cancer. I'm not going to call it leukemia. All I'm saying is that I'm praying and believing for my blood work to come back completely normal. But you both still struggle with fear, right? Well, you know, fear, fear is to hell what faith is to the believer. The very first emotion in God's word was fear. And we had traveled, ministering, doing all of that for years, but had never confronted fear. And I, I can remember getting ready to speak to 10,000 young people and sneaking out in an alley and calling her and saying, I'm scared. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, fear is not the absence of courage, it's mm -hmm. the embryo of courage. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and fear is a learned or perceived aberration that you allow to become an absolute. So when we begin to write this book, we didn't want to. The opening chapter is called, We Didn't Want to Write This Book, because <laughs> what you write about, you'll fight against. And we decided, wait a minute, we're not. The devil's a liar. Mm -hmm. We have the lion of the tribe of Judah. He prowls around like a lion, That's but right. he's not the lion. Right. You've got to get your roar. And Karen, you refuse treatment. I mean, how, how did you get well? Well, I actually had never made it to that point of radiation or chemo. So uh, when the doctor kept t testing my blood, I kept putting off getting a bone marrow biopsy until I went to uh, Brazil to speak at a women's conference that was in Brazil. And when I was in Brazil, the Holy Spirit, the same voice that spoke to me and said, do you trust me, said your blood has been made whole. And so we were actually going back to the doctor for the bone marrow biopsy. And that's when the doctor walked in and said, I can't understand it. I don't, I can't explain it. Your blood work is completely normal. I have oh never goodness. seen this happen before. In fact, he's using her report at other oncologist conferences <laughs> and saying, 
what happened here? Yeah. In fact, he got, he got upset with us for not then putting his name put in the book. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. But, of course, you, we know what happened. It was a yeah. miracle. Well, what three truths from Second Timothy helped you to fight fear when you were going through this? Well, it was a morning that was hard because fear did try to creep in right. many times during that season. The what-ifs would try to come in. And God took me to Second Timothy 1.7 that says, I didn't give you a, a spirit of fear or panic, but I gave you power, love, and a sound mind. Mm. And we read those so many times, just um, like, Power, love just, and a sound yeah, mind. just and, no big deal. And I love how in your book, how you break it down. Yes. You know, yes. what it really means to have really means. the yes. love of God and how That's that can right. heal you and the power of God. Yes. And Pat, you, after Karen, after the blood test came back and she was normal, yes. of course you were, you know, relieved, but you just wanted to rest yeah. um, after the healing. What did God say to you when you just were like, Lord, I need a break? Yeah. Well, that's what it was. It was on the other side of it. And I'll never forget it was during the Kavanaugh hearings and I was watching this poor fellow get attacked yeah. uh, just demonically and for the life of a child. And all of a sudden in that hotel room, the Lord said, what happened to your roar? And he took me to Amos 3, 8, as the lion roars, so the prophet speaks. And folks, yeah. you're watching right now. Yeah. The enemy is speaking to you. He's attacking you. Mm -hmm. Get your roar back. Rise up and realize. Get your, what you say, we praise during the storm. We yeah. praise on the other side of it. And when you begin to realize why the lion roars, because it's hungry, to declare its location, to declare its strength, to tell other lions where it's at, and it roars in the morning and the evening, you begin to realize God's given us a pattern to run mm -hmm. after the lion of the tribe of Judah I and get that. our praise back. Right. I went to Africa on my honeymoon this year and we heard the lion roar yeah. uh, when we were in a tented camp. And, <laughs> and it made me really think about, you know, the title of your book, Restore the Roar, and how there, there is a purpose for that roar. Yes. Well, Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee for no reason, but the righteous are as bold as lions. And I just heard a lion roar in South Africa two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> It'll scare you. <laughs> I know, you. You don't think of it the same any, anymore. Well, your story is incredible. Your book, amazing. Thank you so much for writing it. Uh, the book, again, it's called Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Breath and Power of God, and it's available wherever books are sold. Pat and Karen, God bless you guys. Thanks oh, for being here. I'm so glad you. your dream came true to be on the 700 Hey, Club. Yes. this is it. We are so honored, and we, and we love, and we yes. believe. You pull so on the grounds honored. here, and you feel the presence of God yes. here in, around the university and everything. Well, That's you'll meet right. Pat in a minute. Well, still to come. Your email questions. Lucia says, it is essential for Christians to stand against the slaughter in Syria. Even the Jews were allowed to arm themselves against Haman. Why not the Kurds? Your questions, honest answers straight ahead. When you fall. Welcome back. It's time for your questions and some honest answers from Pat. Let's start with David's. He says, I've read in the Bible that knowledge will increase in the last days, but I've never read that humans will go to planets like Mars. From a biblical perspective, will God allow such things to take place before or during the tribulation? Well, the truth is God's allowing us to do planetary uh, exploration right now. The truth is Mars is a inhabitable rock. Mm -hmm. The other planets are a bunch of rocks. We're living in the most beautiful planet of all the planets. It's a special place as a habitation for human beings. And I don't know why anybody would want to leave this to go to some hunk of rock out in the stars. But uh, there will be some interplanetary, but that's not what the Bible is talking about. Knowledge will increase, but it is increasing exponentially. Are the uh, uh, amount of knowledge that's available to us right now is nothing short of awesome. Just a little thing that you hold in your hand, a little iPod, you can punch up stuff and you can get voluminous information. And uh, we have the ability to send in a matter of seconds all of the books that would be stored in the Library of Congress, put down in the digital form. So without question, knowledge has exploded on this planet. You don't have to go to any other planet, all right? Remember in high school, you had to go to the library and get encyclopedias to do a book report. That's right. Now you don't have to do that you, anymore. All you do is punch up and mm -hmm. you, you... There it is. You, you, you can solve your own there. health right. crisis with Google. All right. Lucia says, for Christians to have any credibility in the non-Christian world, it is essential for Christians to stand against the slaughter in Syria. Even the Jews were allowed to arm themselves against Haman. Why not the Kurds? Well, look, I, 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 am, I suggested, as a matter of fact, to one of our leaders who will remain nameless, 
that we uh, sell arms to the Kurds. But here's what used to happen. The Kurds were under the control of, of the Iraqi government, which in turn was controlled by Baghdad. So if we would send weapons to Baghdad, they would hold them. They wouldn't send them on to the Kurds. So I think absolutely we ought to give the Kurds all they need to defend themselves. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that, and we should be done. All right. All right, Rhonda writes in, recently I've had a long discussion with my pastors about a problem going on in our church that I disagree with them about. Everything seemed great, but then the pastor's wife started ignoring me. It's not like it wasn't noticeable since we are both on the praise and worship team. This has gone on for several weeks and I'm not sure what I need to do. I've supported my pastors for over 15 years and when I didn't agree with them, I don't want to leave the church because I feel like they are all family and I love them. What should I do? Well, you know what the Bible says, if you have ought against any, you go to your brother and tell him the problem. Why don't you go to that pastor's wife and say, listen, uh, we're on the worship team together. You know, how come you're not talking to me? And I really enjoyed the fellowship. Or maybe you could give her a gift and say, uh, here's something that uh, I thought would be special. Find out something she would like and then give it to her. And all of a sudden, she, her heart will be open. But what is it that's wrong with her? You've got to find out. You really need to put yourself in the position of somebody else. What is it that's her problem? Have you offended her? Is she dislike you for some reason? Is there somebody talking about you to her with slander? I mean, what's going on? I mean, go to the one in the spirit of meekness, lest you yourself be tempted, and say, and get it right with your brother or sister. That's what the Bible says. So that you don't, quote, walk out. Try to fix it, you know. All That's right. a good word. Okay. Very good. All right. Audie says, hello, I am a new landlord. <laughs> we still have a mortgage on the rental property. We also cover the water, sewer, and trash for the rental property. My question is, do I tithe on the entire rental income or just on what would be considered profit after expenses are covered? You know, I was once talking to the Secretary of Treasury about how we ought to count for taxes, and Ronald Reagan thought that Tax, tax uh, uh, deductions should be allowed on the gross income, not the net. But as far as your tithe, I think your obligation is to pay the tithe on the profit, not on the gross. If grocery stores, for example, tithe on their, their gross, they wouldn't have any money left because their, their margins are so thin. They have huge gross, but not much net. So normally speaking, I think the tithe would be on the net, but the the government allows you a tax deduction, I, I believe, on the gross. So that's 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 a, that's good news to a lot of people watching right now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, today's power minute is from Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Well. Thank you for being with us. It's good to have all of you with us. And I appreciate the fact that Wendy's here. She's here on Wednesday. I wish she was here more often. It's always good to see you. Thank you, sir. God, God bless, bless you. you. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.